um, live during this present pandemic. Uh, we were thinking of ways to reach out more to you. We know a lot of you are home right now, working from home, being bored from home. Um, and so we thought we'd start doing lives at Thursday at 1 p.m. And today, our director, Leslie Pilak, myself, Caitlin Donnelly, we're gonna be talking about an anniversary that recently came up in <clears throat> Birmingham history. It's kind of a tragic anniversary, but I think um, we'll both kind of touch on ways that it does impact Birmingham today, even though the murder of Polly and Cynthia Utter happened way back in 1825. And this is a story of how Birmingham became Birmingham and how we have Greenwood Cemetery today. So, And we want to emphasize too that we want this to be a live conversation. So if you have a question or a comment or anything you'd like to contribute while we're on the air uh, live, which is about, uh, we think about 20 minutes, half hour, something like that, talking about this matter, you know, chime in. Also, um, we, we are not presenting this as like we're gonna lecture to our audience about what happened. We're really wanting to con converse with each other and sort of throw out these um, hard to pin down issues that happened in 1825 when this murder occurred. So we'll give you some facts and we'll invite you to respond or ask questions as we go through, but really it's a conversation, so you're included. Yeah, so I guess to get started, let's talk about the facts of this case as we know them. Um, so this happened in 1825 when Birmingham really didn't have that many residents. They were mostly focused up and down the Saginaw Trail, which is now Woodward Avenue. Um, and there was maybe six families, six, seven, eight. So not a whole lot of people. And those of you who are familiar with the museum, you'll know that the Hunter House the oldest house in Birmingham, the oldest house in Oakland County, was built in 1822. So we're only three years after John West Hunter building the Hunter House. Um, so there was a family living along the Saginaw Trail. They were the Utter family. They were tenant farmers, so they didn't own the land. So we had some difficulty, some challenges, trying to figure out where exactly they lived, and Leslie's been doing a lot of work with that. She has a map of where we think they were living at this time in 1825. Right, to set that up a little bit, we have um, information that at that time, Birmingham wasn't a village. Birmingham didn't even have the name Birmingham. It was the wilderness. It was forested, it had wolves and bears roaming around, and it had this group of cabins that um, were built by settlers who had come up the Saginaw Trail, which is now Woodward Avenue, as Caitlin was saying, and had you know established their homesteads here and there. So what we did, what I did was I uh, tried to reconstruct, because this all is important for the murder that took place um, in 1825. So I do have a, a map to show you. This is the the overview, this is all of Bloomfield Township. Okay, so this is a six by six mile area, the entire square here. And um, you can see that along this section, there's a, um, this is where some of the land purchases had taken place. So let me just advance to a detail that I also have. Okay, so on this detail, you can see the blue dotted area is the Saginaw Trail, and you can see some of these land parcels have an orange glow, and there's a red box in those. Those are the people we know were settled here at the time. And everything takes place on and around where this yellow box is, which is where we think um, these tenant farmers were, uh, their, where their cabin was located at the time. And so, um, the family name was Utter, U-T-T-E-R, and I'm gonna let Caitlin tell you more about the details. Yeah. So we had um, John Utter, the husband and father, his wife, Polly, and both of the, Polly was 44, and I believe John was around the same age. Um, they had a son, Joseph, who was around 14, 15, a daughter, Cynthia, who was 13, 
and a four-year-old named Mary Ann. Um, and so they were all living in this cabin and there was another person living with them. They had a man boarding with their family named Emery Fish. And Emery was the brother of, <coughs> sorry, one of their neighbors, Elijah, who was also living in the area. Um, because again, like Leslie said, it was heavily wooded. Um, everyone needed help, you know, felling trees to build up their farm. Um, and so um, on Sunday, April 6th, um, Elijah Fish, Emery's brother, he knew Emery was going over to the Utter residence and he knew that that morning he had been found um, at someone's tavern without any clothes. So he had brought him back to his house and Emery said something about going to get his papers at the Utter residence. Um, so Elijah lets Emery go. A little while later, he hears screams coming from that general direction. Um, so he runs over and he finds his brother standing over the body of Polly Utter and he gives chase. Emery turns around and says, you want killing too? Elijah books it out of there. Um, and then later on that night, this was in the evening and after dark, John and Joseph come in. They had been going on a day trip somewhere and they come home and they find not only Polly, but also Cynthia as well. Um, and there is a detail that the toddler, Marianne, was found safe in the house. And so Emery is caught very shortly thereafter um, and he is taken up to a jail in Pontiac. And this is Oakland County's first court case, um, basically, where they put Emery on trial and there's so few people that are able to sit on a jury in 1825 in Oakland County, because of course women couldn't sit on juries yet. Uh, there's only men of a certain age that Elijah Emery's brother has to sit on the jury. That's gonna convict his brother of murder. Um, Emery is found not guilty by what we would now call reasons of insanity. Um, at that time, you know, they're their, uh, their rationale, the wording that they used was, you know, he did not have the fear of God before his eyes, um, and he would eventually die in prison. And, I mean, what comes after that is, you know, a, a lot of stories told by the families involved, stories told by, you know, historians like myself, or just, we're trying to fill in the gaps of the story because we don't have all the details, and the details that we do have are sparse, and there's some weird things going on and so you know we're doing what everyone tries to do which is to fill in the gaps and make a cohesive and compelling story um, and so you know one of the first things that kind of intrigues me is that first report that we have from the Detroit Gazette they reported this on April 8th 1825 and this story is just a paragraph it's really short but they mentioned that there is drips of blood in the house and so of course you know I, I watch a lot of forensic files I mean it's 2020 we're all trying to solve the Bliska axe murders at 3 a.m. Um, yeah I, you know I, I, the first thing that comes to mind is because Elijah does report that Emery had also killed his horse at some point during all of that so did Emery come in waving the axe around you know, leaving blood in the cabin, and that's when the women distracted him by running out and thus saving the child. There is that family story from um, Mary Ann's um, great great granddaughter that she um, told to the museum that's, you know, um, well, Polly shoved Mary Ann underneath the bed, and that's why she survived. Um, and uh, actually, we had a lot of questions about the sequence of the events. Uh, what was reported in the um, the Detroit Gazette at the time. I mean, this is a reporter gathering facts two days later, and then there's a second follow-up article of a week later that has more information. Um, and, and that was as intriguing as it was, it's like any newspaper account, you know, there, there could be errors. It's reporting the best that they can with the information they have. So, um, I wanted to do more about this. I went to the county in a, about a year ago, maybe two years ago, 
and I dug into what's left of the records. Some of the records are missing. It's been 195 years, so some of the original uh, witness testimony is still available, and I um, photocopied that and brought it back, and we translated it. So that gives a little more information. And then two years ago, we did a presentation, and I I um, invited uh, my my buddy, Lieutenant um, Scott Brewery from the police department, Birmingham Police, to look at what we knew and give his take on it. And so he had his perspective of what could have happened in what order was really interesting. So I, I thought maybe I could share some of that too. So we have some facts. We know a horse was axed to death. We know that um, Cynthia Ann, the 13 year old girl, was killed. Uh, with an axe, and we know that her mother Polly was killed with an axe. We uh, there is a report that there were blood um, drips in the house. We know that the murder took place um, around dusk because uh, Elijah, who had encountered his brother with the axe um, after hearing the screams, is reporting. You know that's right when it happened, and we know that it was getting dark. Um, we also um, uh, have information on the exact nature of the injuries and they were they died fairly quickly from from what we can tell so we know that Emery who um, admitted to the murders had served in the war of 1812 and that he had had problems for about nine years and it had been about nine years since since the war was over he was a single person. He was an, kind of an itinerant helper. And he, like all of the settlers in the area, was a veteran of a horrific war. Um, soldiers would have seen all kinds of um, horrifying experiences. And um, the weapons that were often used during the war were also hand-to-hand um, -hand combat, swords, axes, and so forth. So the question about why an ax has come up, and I think, Caitlin, maybe you can take, take that up. Yeah, so, I mean, nowadays, um, what kind of the science of the psychology tells us is axes are very personal weapons. If you kill someone with an ax, you're getting up close, you're getting personal. Um, it's, it's intensely a personal um, emotion that you're feeling. However, 1825, Axes were super common. You would have had an axe probably possibly within your front door. You would have had axes outside. I mean, you would have used it for everything because most people were using wood to cook on, to heat their homes at this time. And of course, if you're heating with wood, you need to cut down the logs in order to you know, make them fit into your stove or whatever you're using. Um, so an axe back then would have been just lying around. So really, I mean, Commander Gruy kind of came to the conclusion that it was a crime of opportunity. Um, but of course, there's no way to know. I think all, really all of Emery said when they caught him is that he had to do it. And knowing that his state of mind wasn't the most stable, um, his family said he had epilepsy, which in 1825 is a catch-all term for anything not quite neurotypical going on up here. So that could um, include everything from what today we know as, as, as epilepsy all the way to you know being on the autism spectrum or hearing voices. Um, so it's something that tells us a lot but also doesn't really tell us anything as well. So you know some people have speculated that maybe it was also some PTSD too um, from the experiences that he had gone through during the war. And again, there's there's no way to know what he had done, what he had seen, um, and if he did have any trauma from that experience. So again, uh, more questions than we have answers. Um, once again, though, I think the events as um, Lieutenant uh, Gruy had laid them out was, we know that Elijah Fish encountered his brother with the ax after he heard screams, and he saw his brother um, near the Polly, who was the mother. Cynthia had already been killed by that point, but Elijah didn't know that because he didn't see her. 
when she was found, she was at the wood pile. So, um, as um, Lieutenant Groovy was laying out, he, he was saying, well, of course, he doesn't know without facts, but it sort of suggests that the first murder was Cynthia Ann, the daughter. She was at the wood pile. That's where the axe was located, and that it's very possible that she was approached in some way, something happened, and uh, Emery grabbed the axe and killed her and then pursued her mother, who was not far away, and maybe went into the cabin and came back out, dripping you know, blood off the axe. We do know that the four-year-old was, was not harmed, but we don't know why. And um, I think uh, this is part of the story where, uh, as we look back on something that happened all that time ago, and we try to think about it in terms that make sense to us, um, that's where some of these family traditions have filled in gaps, um, maybe because they're accurate, or maybe because it's something that someone hoped happened. Um, so it's, it's unclear about uh, exactly why Marianne survived, but she did. So we have two children who actually survived. One was the teenage son who was actually with the father. He wasn't even at the site. And the other one is Marianne, who is about four years old. Uh, fast forward, um, she was raised by people nearby. We'll get into that in a minute. So we do have a question from Leslie Page. She wants to know, did you say he was acquitted by reason of insanity? Where did he live out his days after that? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, so he was in the Pontiac jail, and we have records of him dying a few years later after the fact. Um, so he didn't live very long after that. And if he um, talked to anyone about what was going on, where his head was at while he did these things, if he had any remorse, unfortunately, we don't have records of that in the Oakland County court systems that we've been able to find. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what happened afterward. Yeah. Want to pick that up? Right. So um, at this time, I mean, there's only a couple families around the area. We have a couple different things going on. We have the women of the community coming together, and they are um, making burial shrouds for Cynthia and Polly. They wanted them to be buried properly, be given a proper burial. Um, and of course, I mean, Detroit's a day away. Pontiac's a day away, so what these women were doing is basically just bringing their scraps over to the house to make these shrouds for these women. Um, and uh, another local man, Zyba Swan, he, according to the local story, again, we don't have any documentary evidence of this, but this is a story that we have, um, he was the one who recommended Emory to the Utters as a boarder. And again, according to the story, he felt so guilty about it that he donated half an acre of his land so that the women could have a proper burial. And over time, this becomes Greenwood Cemetery. It's one of the older public cemeteries in Michigan. Um, and unfortunately, it comes out of this tragic occurrence. But really, I think it, it's hard to say, but this really brings people in the community together. Um, brings them together in a way that unfortunately sometimes you don't see unless something really really bad happens like a 9-11 or this current pandemic where people are willing to lay everything aside and help their neighbors out. So we have members of the community coming together to help John raise his remaining two children. You know we have people coming together to make sure these women have a proper burial to make sure that you know we have this memory of them and then you know Greenwood Cemetery and all that. So, I mean, would we just be just another part of Bloomfield uh, or Bloomfield Hills had this unfortunate tragedy not happened? It's hard to say because in these accounts from the Gazette, Birmingham isn't really a village. Um, they're just saying, hey, yeah, this cabin five miles from Pontiac. And then in the 1830s, we get people starting to name this settlement. So they're calling it Hunters or Willets, um, Birmingham pops up in around uh, the 1830s as well. Piety Hill. Piety Hill. Um, so there, there is this, this coalescing of a community 
And, you know, was this the spark point of that? Was it already happening and maybe this accelerated it? We don't know for sure, but um, it seemed that this really was a starting off point for people starting to think of this settlement as a community. So here is that map again. For those of you who are curious about this, again, this is the place we thought the cabin probably uh, was located where the murder took place. You can see that the scale is, this is a mile. Um, Ziba Swan lived here. This is where Woodward Avenue is now. And he donated the back uh, southwest corner of his property as the original um, component of Greenwood Cemetery. Later, more acreage was added to it. Um, so, just so you know the association between these different cabins. And here's Elijah Fish, uh, Ingrid's brother, where his cabin was. So I just thought you might see, this is, this is pretty much all the settlers in this entire area. We have another question. Are there gravestones still in Greenwood? Yes, so if you go into the easternmost entrance of Greenwood Cemetery, you will see the oldest part of the cemetery. And we actually have a walking tour on our website. If we have another beautiful day like yesterday and you wanna get out, walk around um, and see some of this, you definitely can. Um, and there is an obelisk monument to the Utters um, with Polly, Cynthia, and John as well. It's um, just inside the gate. Just inside the easternmost gate. Yeah, yeah, if you go and you look for the biggest obelisk right inside, mm -hmm. that's where the Utters are. Um, and then other members of the Utter family. Mm -hmm. So we have um, Joseph's family. They're all buried there, even though they might not have lived in Birmingham all that much. Actually, Joseph's family oh, yeah, stuck this, nearby. It right, was, it was Marianne yeah, and um, her right. husband, Hezekiah. Um, they were brought back by their family members to be buried there. As well as I think it's so interesting that the fishes are buried almost directly behind the Utter family. And I think that speaks a lot to um, forgiveness within the community. Um, you hear now sometimes that, you know, people who have committed heinous actions, their families are ostracized from their communities. Um, but it doesn't seem like anyone really did that to the fishes. Um, they were still kind of integral members of the community. Elijah was a deacon. We're not sure if he was a deacon before or after this. Um, but he seemed to be a central member of one of the religious communities that was around here. Um, and his family as well, you know, they married into other families in this area. So I, I don't know, I think that's, that's really interesting. And there's a story there too that unfortunately we don't know. And I wish so much that we knew it. <laughs> yes, and back briefly to Marianne. Uh, so she, as a, as a young woman at age 18, she married um, a man who was, uh, whose first wife had died and they actually relocated. They were in the Flint area and then they were in Ovid, Michigan for a long time, which is um, like northeast of Lansing. Most of their lives were lived there and yet their children um, are all buried at Greenwood. Interestingly, they came back to Greenwood, even though they had spent decades away. Um, so a visit to Greenwood isn't complete if you're gonna look at the Utter site without looking at the Rollies, who are Marianne's um, descendants. And there are Rollies still around who have communicated at different times. Some of these family stories have come from the Rollies, in fact. Um, so, you know, check it out when you can and um, let us know what you think. If you come across anything, uh, have another take on this, or maybe you have another question right now that we can answer. Yeah, and I mean, what I think is interesting too is um, the story of Mary Utter, who we recently discovered here in our archives at the museum. And I put discover in quotes because we had a scrapbook related to her in our archives. Um, we had other documentation of her life, but we weren't looking for her. So we had this story of the Utter family murders, and we're like, oh, well, maybe their family is still around. Maybe they did have descendants in Birmingham. We don't know. Um, come to find out, you know, we come across this scrapbook, and Donna, who is manning the camera now, um, she's taking a closer look at it. She's like, wait a minute, Mary Utter, do you think 
Do you think she's really, she, um, she was running for office in the 1920s as soon as women got the right to vote. Um, she was serving on juries in the 1920s, which means as soon as she got the right to vote, she was going out there and she was registering, she was doing all this stuff. And come to find out even before 1920s, she was like on the cemetery association. So we have receipts in our archives of people buying their plots at Greenwood Cemetery and there's her signature. Like she was there all along, but we weren't looking for her. So explain who she was and what line. Yeah, so she was John's youngest daughter. That is correct, yes. Donna is nodding her head. <laughs> um, she, she did a lot of work with Mary Utter for our, um, our current exhibit, Beyond Suffrage. Um, so yeah, she's, she's the youngest daughter. And Not John, Joseph. Joseph. I just want to say that she was the youngest, um, but all three of her brothers passed away within a two-year time period in their 20s when she mm. was just 12, so she would end up being the only child. Wow, okay, so she kind of had that weird experience where you're, you're, you're the youngest for a while, and then all of a sudden you got all the responsibility. Um, and so she has this really long career of just being super involved in the civic life in Birmingham, so she's on the um, the Cemetery Association. She's running for office. She's but getting she, involved in politics. But she never married. And I think at that time, women who married did not have doors open to them. But this single person, this single woman who had come through all of this in this family story, I mean, she ended up having a lot of freedom um, because this was a time when women, you know, if you can have, have an opportunity to get into our exhibit in future programs, we'll tell you more about um, the problems with women having access to voting, with uh, having access to rights, and how that limited them. But some of the women in Birmingham stood out anyway, and she's one of them. So she was a school teacher. School teachers were not permitted to marry, um, but she took care of her, her mother after her father died, her brother Joseph died. Um, and she stayed in Birmingham and she continued to contribute to the society. And so that's an interesting legacy too. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, like, so the Utter family, I mean, it wasn't just this one tragic event that was helping to shape Birmingham. It was the people who were coming after who still felt an affinity for this place, even though they were raised, you know, north of Lansing or who were getting involved in the city council and all that. So. I mean, I think sometimes we like to hit upon these, these big tragic touch points in history, but sometimes what comes after is, is just as interesting and sometimes even more important. Okay, so for we're going to wrap this up. So a defining moment in Birmingham's development as a community was this tragic and horrific, shocking affair. People came together, uh, a cemetery was founded, a community grew and was held together, and our cemetery, Greenwood Cemetery, helps tell that story even today. So um, a lot of questions will never be answered, but the stories live on, and so um, we're happy to be able to share that with you. We're gonna to continue to do these programs on Thursdays. Did you wanna say more about yeah, that? Yeah, Thursdays at one, and if you have any questions about Birmingham history or history in general that we can kind of touch on in relation to Birmingham history. Let us know if you're watching this later on and you have further questions about the story about the Utters. Um, let us know that as well and we will do our best to answer those uh, with the information that we have. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for the questions and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.